Saw you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin. Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus
Thank you this evening that we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above every other name. Thank you, Lord, that the cross is sufficient for us, Lord, for our forgiveness, Lord, for our freedom. Those who the Son has set free is free indeed. And tonight we just respond, Lord, to your goodness in our lives, to your drawing in our lives, Lord. Thank you for your invitation, Lord, to be in your house tonight, Lord. We're not inviting you, you've invited us, and we want to thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place, Lord. Let's just all close our eyes and just, let's just sing that part, you are worthy of it all. Just bring yourself, your life to God, where we say, Lord, we place all the worth, all the life we place on you, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. you are all 
deserve the glory. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that you are worth our lives, Lord. Why don't you just turn to somebody next to you if you feel comfortable, put your hands on their shoulders and just bless them. Say, Father, I ask that you bless Serena or Sabrina or Susanna or Chabo. Let's just take a moment as we bless each other. Just with God's peace, with God's life, with His abundance. stuff and when you're finished you may be seated wow it's so nice to see some of you back some uh, second and third years and fourth years only year uh, almost a year ago we saw some of you what a great privilege and uh, we decided to order some cold weather for this evening if you are very cold and you didn't bring a jacket you may be not on the group and you didn't register we have 60 blankets and some amazing guys like uh, Clint and Jonathan and Ulrich, young Hibar months. They're going to come around and we just put up your hand if you need a blanket and you're very cold and you didn't bring a jacket. Okay, we're also going to give you an opportunity to give to God. So, oh, there's a hand, some hands at the back, some cold people. Hey, Vicky, you have a jacket on. Okay, if you're living in the same house, you're allowed to sit close to each other. Okay, so if you're living in the same house, the same family, move closer, keep each other warm. Okay, great. Just everyone's uh, be quiet for a moment. They said I'm too short. What a compliment. But um, uh, there's an offering bag going by. So if you want to drop in those cards for us, if you're uh, a visitor here and you would um, like us to follow you up, uh, there's also a Google Doc that you were supposed to sign up for us so that we have you on the database. Uh, we're going to just, while we're taking up the offering, show you a short video. We are so excited. Is there any first years here? Will you quickly stand for us? All the first years. Woo! Welcome to all of you. Great. Well, welcome. Uh, there's a lot of faces we are recognizing from the camp. So we're going to show you a short video clip of the first year's camp. We baptized 21 people on the first year's camp. So God is really moving and doing a lot of great things. So um, if you guys are ready, we're going to show you that video. You can take my morning, turn into dancing, Lord. Are you ready? <laughs> take a broken vessel, put it back together, Lord. You can take the scars and do Your goodness does. 
your captain speaking. Welcome to Shofar Airlines. This is uh, the Quantum 383. It takes 11 passengers to and from, full of gears and all the energy you could ever ask for. Choices do determine where you end. Remember what my head said. Lekker, lekker. Just didn't you know, Ben, say, I like that smile on your face. Sure. Um, Ulrich, Ulrich, can you just please stand at the back there? Ulrich, that was on the form. Ulrich, Stellan was high school. Apparently, it cost 50 rand to touch his snore, okay? So, just he said there's a special on tonight. But welcome, Ulrich, all the way from the north, back here in Stellenbosch. We just want to welcome everyone that's back, and uh, it's just so great. Obviously, you've noticed that uh, church does look a little bit different. Normally, we are almost a thousand students in there, and um, but now we're sort of meeting all over the place. There's young working people in the Baptist church, the office. There's lots of places. So even today, we have almost 800 people meeting in different venues. So please help us to sign up by Friday. Otherwise, you are not going to be able to come to church next week. Um, if you uh, try to sign up on a Sunday now, you're not going to get space anymore because next week all the seniors are back and then uh, we're going to be full, okay? Uh, we're still planning a lot of stuff and I want us just to give a round of applause to the logistics team to making all this work and bring out the screens out and all this stuff um, because we having a 7 o'clock service as well here in the Baptist Church and all over. Okay, so... So please sign up. If you don't know, then there's an info group in that little brochure. There's a Stelly's info group that you must just click the WhatsApp group, belong to that group, and then you will get all the spams during the week. Because sometimes the venues are going to change just uh, two hours before the time. So um, turn to your neighbor and say, hey, be ready. <coughs> Great stuff. Next week, we have a surprise. Uh, I don't know if you have that slide on, but um, next week, uh, Pastor Werner Hubert, the fan favorite from Survivor, some of you would have recognized him. He's going to speak especially to the students, 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock service, okay? So, young working people, sorry, you need to go to the other services. You can watch it later online, um, but he's going to be at 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock, so uh, register by tomorrow, otherwise you're not going to get space, so he's going to come uh, speak to us and just, you know, bless us with uh, sharing the Word of God. I want to I wanna jump straight into it in Matthew 16. Uh, the title of tonight's sermon is, As We're Pursuing the Kingdom of God, that's our theme scripture for the year, is seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then He will add all things to us. Turn to your neighbor and say, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and He will add all things to you. A lot of people are panicking, and a lot of people are afraid uh, of what's happening, what's going to happen in their future. And uh, Jesus says the answer for that, to get the right immune system, to get the right spiritual vaccine, is simply to seek first the kingdom of God. And uh, when you do that, you're going to live in a space where you're going to know who God is. You're going to begin to discover Him because God is not primarily interested in your comfort zone. Did you know that? 
You know, lots of people say, Lord, please be with me, but that's not a scriptural uh, prayer. The Lord says, go, and I will be with you. <laughs> so as you go, He will be with us, even to the end of the age. And so tonight we're talking about give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Matthew 16, verse 20 to 26. Uh, Jesus speaking, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that we, he was Jesus the Christ. And from that time, 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 Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. There's exclamation mark. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Okay, that's how you should read scripture because there's an exclamation mark. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Okay, so it was quite tough, you know, because normally if there's an exclamation mark, the, some of you with the English vocabulary, I know the people from the States and from Namibia, the free states I'm talking about, you know, and the English needs some translation. But in any case, <laughs> and so listen to this. So, um, so Peter comes to the stage where He's confronted with Jesus going to the cross, but Jesus is in, intently, urgently focusing on, and he's actually telling his disciples, don't tell people that I am the Christ. Don't tell the people around there. And then he begins to talk about the cross, and Peter thinks like, no, 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 this, this is not going to work out for me. I want to I wanna rule with Jesus here on earth, because you know, the disciples wanted that. Even Jesus' own brother didn't believe that he was the Messiah until Jesus rose from the dead. Later on, his brother became one of the heads of the church in Jerusalem. So there was a lot of unbelief and a lot of selfish motive and a lot of like, and especially Peter. Peter was like straight up there. He said, look here, Jesus, I'm going to take you aside because this kite is not going to fly. You know, <laughs> while it's on my watch, this thing is not going to work. So he takes Jesus aside and he says, Jesus, you're not going to go to the cross. And then Jesus um, uses this word, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Sure. Even with us tonight, and maybe you're a first year here, you have a choice. To be mindful of the things of God, or to be mindful of the things of people. The one that you are mindful of the most will determine your identity, your sense of belonging, where you're going, what's going to happen in your life. And so Peter was mindful of the things of people, of his own motives, of what people were saying around. So he was mindful more of what the people said because he wanted to hear the opinion of people more than what God said. And, and the Lord says, because that is the root in your heart, you can't see where I'm going. So, so I'm taking authority over this thing in your life. And then Jesus defines with his disciples, what does it mean to be a disciple? He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So, so there's this like this big, almost wrestling between Peter and the disciples and Jesus, and it's sort of a turning point because now Jesus is going to the cross and he wants to set out a value, a, a principle, something that will change their lives forever. Are you going to be mindful of the things of God or are you going to be mindful of the things of what people say? And I don't know about you, you know, with this whole, you know, new Instagram and Facebook and everything, do you know that this generation, many of you sitting here, are the most lonely generation that has ever lived? And yet we are the most busy and most distracted generation ever because we're on our phones. We're very busy by seeing how many likes you have, how many stuff. But if you really, if it's just you and your bed in the middle of the night, many people are very lonely. Many people are struggling really with heaviness. Do you know that 65% of Stellenbosch University students cannot cope studying through their exams without using some sort of method of something, a substance that they need to cope with going through their life. So, so, so we're not that great as what we think. <laughs> we think, well, oh, you know, we're this like amazing people. We climb the mountains. We extreme people. And yet we're the most lonely people that has ever lived. Every one of us under the age of 25, all of us, yeah, 
tonight under the age of 25. But Jesus says this profound thing. He says, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. The, lo the, you know, the world says, find your life, find your life, go out there, explore. And Jesus says, no, lose your life to find it. The world says, find your life, and eventually, maybe, you are going to lose it. The, you know, the gospel is completely different to what the world offers us. Why? Because what the gospel offers us is the real Jesus, real forgiveness, real identity, real belonging, real life in abundance. Isn't that true? Thank you for that. Amen. That was a good place to say amen. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, I agree. I agree. Or keep quiet if you don't agree. Okay. This is church. Okay, so I don't know if you can see from the back, but what do you think I have here? A spoon. No, no, no. It's not a spoon. It's a fork. Okay. It's an it's a ordinary fork. Okay. The question I have tonight is, you know, there, there are one of these in a museum in England. And people go there and they watch that uh, fork in this, behind this glass and you're not allowed to touch it. I'm allowed to touch this one because this is an ordinary fork, you know. But the one in the museum in England is behind this glass because Sir Winston Churchill used that fork. Is it, is it, is it the same thing? It's a fork. It's like a spoon. You eat with it, okay? Except if you're in India, then you don't eat. You eat with your hands. But so, yeah, we eat with a fork. But what makes this fork different than the fork in the museum that everyone, everyone goes to stand in front of that glass and say like, wow, did Winston Churchill really eat with that thing? Wow, if we could only touch it. So, it's the same thing. It's just value is added to that one because somebody famous used it. You and I like, like this fork. You can allow somebody in this world to use you. And that's going to determine your value. But when you take the same fork and you put it in the hands of Christ, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, suddenly you become valuable, although you're just very normal. See, the value of the fork is determined by the one who's got it in his hand. And so if you and I would submit our lives to Christ, and this is what he says, this is so profound, because God is not selfish. He says, the first thing that you need to do is deny yourself. Say no to the self. Your biggest enemy, I want you to take your finger and I want you to point it straight at yourself. And say the biggest enemy in your life is you. Okay? Now, no, Gideon, don't look at the people next to you because it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just agree. Point that finger, you know, just, just show it straight. And some of you are enjoying it. And I'll point the finger at you. Just look at that finger. Okay, don't, don't go like dizzy on yourself now, okay? Okay, point at that finger, point that finger at you and say, you are your biggest enemy because of the choices you make. And so Jesus says the greatest challenge isn't the devil, isn't the world out there, it's you, it's me. And you know, we can testify our life isn't so nice because of some of the bad choices we've made. So you say no to self and yes to God. And that's what repentance means. It means turn away to God. It's a 180 degree turn. Anybody here from Metanoia residence? Oh, there's some people there at the back. Oh, metanoia. That's the word. <laughs> repentance. It means to turn, to have, to see who God is. And then to turn from you going this direction, 180 degrees. And you turn and say, God... I realize because you're so good, because you're going to place real identity and value on me because I'm giving my life to you. I'm placing it in your hands. Now I get value. Or I'm going to place it in the world's hands. Or I'm going to place it in somebody else's opinion's hands. And that's what repentance means, is to, to have a change of mind, of direction, of action. Let's begin to follow God. Wow. To change your mind, your direction, and your action concerning life. So deny yourself. Turn to your neighbor and say, deny yourself. So, 
Some of you enjoy that too much, okay? The second thing is take up your cross. He says, unless you deny yourself, unless you take up your cross, what does that mean? It's say yes to a life of service and sacrifice. Sure. You know, we, we have this word love that we use. You know, it's a very cheap word in the world. It's always conditional in the world. But in God's world, there's uh, different words for love. There's filio, there's, uh, which is a friendship love. But then God uses a word love, which is agape, which means unconditional. God says when he uses that word, he says, I love you unconditionally. So God loves us with no strings attached. God loves us with no conditions attached. The most of the people that say they love you, there's always like a bit of conditions. If you do this, then I'm going to love you. You give me your body, I'm going to love you. Girls, if a guy says that, call some of the big guys in church. We'll sort them out with the fork. Okay, but in any case. So, because he's lying to you. He's not loving you. He's lusting you. He just wants something from you. But isn't it amazing in God's agape love, it's unconditionally. And so to serve God with your life, to say yes to God, to say yes to that call of His in your life, it's, it's the greatest thing to ever do. It's not, a, it's not this use like burden because now I can't even have a joke because, you know, I'm, and I grew up in a very religious environment. You're not allowed to laugh in church and especially not lift your hands. I remember coming the first time I was in Paul in the church where the people lifted their hands. There was this big red carpet at the back. And I really thought they slaughtering people behind there. I really thought they, they kill people. And so I said to the Lord, Lord, please, if you take me alive out of this place, I will serve you for the rest of my life. You know, that was a vow I made because I just thought if people lift their hands and sing and do this stuff, you know, they're very crazy because, you know, you need to be dignified before God, you know. You need to sprinkle water and not laugh and be, be a sour upper lip Christian. But God has got a sense of humor. Yeah, God really loves it. And that's why he says, I, I call you my friend. Wow, to be called a friend of God, to know God intimately, to know his unconditional love in your life. That's why then you'll serve him. You'll say, wow, because when I can trust him because he loves me in a different way than other people do. Question is, are you mindful of the things of God or are you mindful of the things of people? I used to fear people a lot because I struggled with fear of rejection. So I played like provincial tennis and did everything in the book. And it was just great when people clapped their hands and did all this great stuff and said, oh, you're so wonderful. And the next day, sure, those same people that put me on the pedestal will criticize and speak badly about me because there was another hero. There's a, there's a guy here, you won't mind me saying it because he's, he's with us in church. Neil Powell, he's a seventh, seventh coach. Uh, he shared this week with a group of the young working men, and he was saying this profound thing. I think it was 2016. Um, they won the World Series. So he was the coach of the world. A year later, they could not get a medal at the Olympics. And he was the worst coach coach of the world. The South African spectators basically slaughtered him <laughs> from being up there to being down there in one year. Because you know the opinion of people are going to swing. And you should not be mindful of what people say about you because they cannot determine your identity and where you're going. They've, they've not made you. And I want to speak especially to the first years here tonight. You know, if you're going to fall for that thing, you're going to run around like a headless chicken. You're going to really not have life. Is, that's probably not the right thing to say in a church service. But you're going to run around clueless, okay? But the amazing thing is when you come to God and say, God, I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. I'm going to sacrifice. And you know that the concept of love is always sacrifice. It's not a feeling. Love is not a feeling first. It's always a sacrifice. That's why people just walk away from marriages today. People just walk away from relationships because they don't know sacrifice. But Jesus, when he says, I love you, he's, he pro he's proven his sacrifice. <laughs> he went to die for you. No one else has ever done that for you. Do you think you can trust him? Huh? Ruach, do you think you can trust him? Yes, you can. <laughs> But it's amazing. 
You can trust him. Huh? Caleb, can you trust him? You can trust him. Caleb is a cool guy sitting up there. So, so we say yes to a life of service and sacrifice. The last thing is he says yes to a life of following him. He says, come follow me and I'll make you. We, sp- we play follow the leader in this Christianity. We follow Jesus. I mean, and follow means a life of obedience. Now, now tonight may seem like something very simple, but you know how few people preach this, even in most charismatic churches today? You'll never wo- hear the word repentance. You'll never hear the word fear of God. You'll never hear the word deny yourself. You'll never hear the word be obedient to His will. Because many churches uses the things of this world to try and attract people to have numbers in their church. But you know, that will never change your life. It's only when we say what Jesus has said. <laughs> wow, but that's not, that's not the way you keep people in the church. Well, I'm not interested in your opinion. <laughs> I want to know, is God welcome in church? I was in America with him, Angus Buck in 2017. And we traveled to all these big churches. And I, I remember, you know, there was this one church, I think 10,000 people per service, six services a Sunday. Massive church, massive church. <laughs> you know, they like have these conveyor belts to get the people in and the conveyor belts to get them out, you know. It was like crazy. And um, <clears throat> I was so excited to go, but I was so depressed when I walked out of there at the end of the fourth service because I couldn't hold it anymore because I realized people are very welcome here. But the problem is God isn't. The question is not is like, Lord, what? Come and help us or whatever. The question is, uh, is God, does he feel welcome in, in your life? And when you invite him in, when you invite him to that place in your heart, that deep place in your heart, he's going to show you his unconditional love. But he's not going to love you and just make you stay the same. You're going to become a disciple. Because the highest form of worship is our obedience. It's not the songs we sing. The songs are great, but the songs are just like, hey, I remember that one of the moments that changed my life was in um, China. We uh, went to the underground church, and it took us about four hours to get to the church service, not because it was so far, but because we had to split up into groups and they had to sneak us into this church. And so this m- amazing moment, they said, we have a worship service. And I thought like, yo, that's going to be great. I'm not going to probably understand the words, ching, chong, chai, whatever they sing, you know, that's like, Chi-chi-chi, you know, that's all like we ching chang or whatever. Sorry, it's like uh, Mandarin. But um, so we were going up the stairs and I was excited. The only problem was I couldn't hear anything. So I thought like, wow, this church must really be amazing because they're not like there's a thousand, two hundred, thousand, four hundred people in the church. And their soundproofing must be amazing because you know what? Sure, I can't hear a word that this massive crowd is singing. Eventually, we got up, and we, uh, we entered in through the back, and then we walked in. There was 1,200 people lying on their faces, worshiping God. For more than three hours, they had a worship service, but there was no songs. They were just lying, just weeping silently before God. Because they've discovered worship. Worship isn't songs. Worship is when I bring myself to Jesus, into his throne room. When I bring all of me and surrender it to him. You see, we've made worship a little song that we sit in onto the CD. Oh, most of you don't even know what a CD is anymore. We, we just get it from Google Play, whatever. So, listen to this in 1 Peter 1 verse 18 to 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But you were redeemed, you were bought with a price, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus went into the throne rooms of heaven and he put down a price. (laughs) He said, I want to pay for that one. I want to pay for that one. I want to own that one. You know the word Lord means, is the word curious, which means the one who owns. Does God own your life? Does he own your body? Does he own your emotions? Does he own your spirit? Because we say, Lord Jesus, but that means much more than just Savior Jesus. Lots of people want to know Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. And so the invitation is like, come and possess. Lord, 
take this thing and use it for your glory. Because in his hands, it becomes something valuable. In his hands, it begins to change. Listen to this in Ephesians 1 verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Sure. And so I, I want to I wanna ask you tonight. If everything, if the, all the music fades and everything else, if it's just you and Jesus, what words will you say to him? I know what he will say to you. He says, come closer. I know you, but I want you to know me. Yeah, but I'm just the first year. I've, I've just come to party. Do you want to be really valuable? Or just, do you just want the opinion of people in your life? Is that a bit tough? It's very tough, but that's the gospel. On the 4th of April, 1989, most of you are not born then, I walked into a teacher's life and I said to him, Mr. Smith, the Jesus that you serve and the Jesus that I'm serving is not the same Jesus. I want to know that one. I was the issue chairman of the school. I was the religious guy. Everyone looked up to me. You know, my roommate was Korne Krieger, which became the Springbok captain, rugby captain. And one night he, night he lied and he asked me like, Sias, how do I know that I'm going to go to heaven? I said, I don't know. Just uh, read your Bible. <laughs> Just like um, pray a little bit, you know. He went to sleep and I was awake the whole night because I couldn't really answer him whether I had surety of my salvation. And so the scripture for you maybe for this year, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 because it talks about the fathers of faith and then and he says therefore we also since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that he set before us looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endure the cross he despised the shame and went to sit at the right hand of the throne of god when you run, look to him. When you run, cast off the weight and the sin. Some of you have, have weights on your shoulders. You're worried about, am I going to make my studies? Am I going am I, am, am I to be good enough? Some of you have sin in your life, addictions that Jesus wants to break. But there's a cloud of witnesses, the men and women of faith mentioned in the previous chapter. Abraham and Noah, and they says, they're cheering you on and say, run. But when you run, don't look at the spectators. Don't listen to the opinion of the people. Run looking unto Jesus. <laughs> and what did Jesus do? Jesus wrote the book of your life. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. So you can ask him. You can be bold to ask him, Lord, what's in that book? What is in this new chapter of my life? But I want to run because I realized there was a joy that was set before you. I realized, Lord, you despise this shame and you, you have sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is interceding for us right now as we're sitting. 24-7, even when you sleep, even when you snore. Any snorers in the house? Oh, there are some people already point to Gerdu and Marlon and all the people at the back, okay? The crazy thing is, is like Jesus knows how many snores you give every night. He knows you better than yourself. And isn't, isn't it amazing when you trust him? Isn't it amazing when you learn to surrender your life to him? And so I really feel strongly that, that that is God's invitation to all of us. Do you just want to be ordinary? Do you want to be an ordinary fork or spoon? But this thing only gets value once it's placed in the one who is the meaning of life, Jesus himself. Wow, is that simple? Yes, but it's a costly. Following Jesus is not easy because you're going to compete with the world. Remember what Jesus said, are you mindful? You're more mindful, Peter, of the things of men than the things of God. Don't know about you. I want to be mindful of the things of God. There was a movie, Shrek. Have you ever, how many of you have heard Shrek? How many of you have seen that movie? Some of you. There was a donkey in that movie. And donk that donkey says, pick me, pick me. Have, have you seen that? My kids watched, you know, I've got two daughters and one son that, that 
daughters just watch Shrek all the time. The son watched Cars, you know, so Cars and Planes, all those ones, you know. But um, I s every time when it comes to that donkey and he jumps up and down and says, pick me, pick me, and the ears goes up and everything is like, you know, and he wasn't picked the first time. But I, I just want to be like that donkey when Jesus says, like, who can we send? <laughs> pick me. <laughs> you know, Lord. <laughs> you know, I, I'm maybe not the best, you know, silver-plated, gold-plated fork in the cabiel of the car or in the whatever. But, Lord, all I know is I don't think anyone has a fork in the cabiel of the car. But in any case, some of you eat sushi with forks and knives and whatever. But in any case, so... The amazing thing is God takes ordinary people and adds value when you're in his hands. And so I don't know about you, but, but I'm so excited for your life and your future. Lots of the first years here, yeah, some of them got baptized this week, and some of them like said, hey, we want to follow God just straight away. Say, we, we want to do it right from the word go. And others said, no, 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 we first want to party. We just want to go out there. We want to first enjoy all of our life. But isn't it a crazy thing that Jesus said? Jesus didn't say, I'm ca coming to give you the 10 steps to life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That means that if you don't know Jesus and you don't do things with him and for him, then you really don't have life according to Jesus. So either Jesus was the son of God or he was really a lunatic. Because he made some strong statements. He didn't say, I'm going to show you the way how to get to Cape Town. Or the free state people, it's that way. Okay? Free state people, that is a mountain over there. It's not a hill. Okay? But if you drive that way, that's Yonkers Hook way. Cape Town is that way. Okay? The flat mountain. That's Table Mountain. Okay, so I'm just giving some people direction. But the point I'm trying to make is Jesus didn't say 10, 10 steps to the way. He said, I am the way. It means you need to come and travel with me. I am the truth. It's a person. The truth isn't reading through the Bible 300 times. The truth is when you're standing in front of Jesus and he speaks a word over your life and it changes your life. When the fact says, no, you are rejected, you're a fear of failure, you're going to fail everything, you're going to just be nowhere, you must just be afraid. And Jesus comes and he says, hey, step out on the water. And Peter says, here I come, Lord. The fact says you cannot walk on water. The truth says when Jesus calls you, you can. Because <laughs> he makes all things new. He does the impossible. Will you stand with me tonight? You see, the gospel is, is very simple for a five-year-old or an eight-year-old. I was in church all of my life, and I never heard the gospel. I've been in many, many spiritful churches and never heard the gospel. Sometimes people preach a gospel that says to you, just be a better person. It's a motivational gospel that says, hey, you must just have hope. Jesus gives hope. Jesus gives life. Jesus gives love. Jesus like, Jesus is just really here to serve you. And you know what? Pick him out on a Sunday. Pick him out on a Wednesday night when you go to small group. But after small group, when you go to the pub, you know, uh, leave him behind. But the crazy thing is, Jesus is either Lord of your life or he's not Lord at all. Is that tough? No. 80% of the church today in the world that are following Christ are suffi suffering immensely for their faith. Tonight in one of the other services, there's a, a lady from France that her mother just last year, re last week rejected her completely because she accepted the Christian faith. And her own mother is plotting to kill her because she became a Christian. She loves Jesus. Is that tough? Well, if you found the pearl of greatest price, 
You know, I've been to the Middle East, I've been to Iran, I've been to places in North Korea, and most Christians there have had a dream of Jesus appearing to them. And they'll always talk about the man who has fire in his eyes. They never talk about the man whose hands touch them, or the one who's got holes in his feet. Or They always talk about, I had a dream. And I remember one of these moments, I met a little nine-year-old boy, Every morning at 3 a.m., he would go into the kitchen, pull down the curtains over the kitchen table, and with his little torch, read the Bible from 3 to 7 a.m. Because it was the only time he could read the Bible without persecution from his own family. And I think like, oh, Lord, there's a lot of dust on some of my Bibles. I remember meeting a family. They were sitting, and the mom felt she must put out an extra plate for people to come and visit. And so that night, she just felt somebody's going to visit, a Muslim family. Somebody knocked on the door just before dinner. And this guy walked in. She said she felt a bit strange because this guy was just like, there was just so much peace about him. He came to sit at the table. And then the father was talking about Isa, which Jesus, a prophet in the Quran. Quran talks about Jesus as a prophet. And so he was asking about this thing, and then this man took bread and he broke it and he says, It's me. And their eyes opened up, and then Jesus disappeared because it physically appeared to that family that the whole family turned to Christ, gave their lives to Christ. They're preaching the gospel today all over Iran, northern parts of Iraq pastors saying hey <laughs> i met a man <laughs> told me all things i ever did one moment in the presence of god will change your life one moment when you see jesus for who he is we're not talking about religion we're not talking about jumping up and down peter couldn't see it jesus even said don't tell the world don't go and put it on your bumper sticker don't tell everyone i'm the christ I'm going to go to the cross. Peter said, no, no, no. Lord, this is not going to work. I want, I, want to, I, want to, I want to do it differently. And then Jesus said, no. Don't be mindful of the things of people. Some of you are very mindful of what people are thinking about you. But they're going to disappoint you. Even people in the church sometimes are going to disappoint you. But I want to tell you, Jesus will never disappoint you. Never. Never. Never, never, Jesus will never disappoint you. One of his names in Scripture, in Revelation, is the one who is faithful and true. He is faithful and he cannot lie. But is this little spoon, little fork, is he willing to place himself tonight in the hands of the one who adds value? Or are you going to dish yourself up to other people? Are you going to just be open to what they say? And that's why it's so important that you belong to a small group where other believers also agree with what God says over your life. With other bunch of believers, because this campus is crazy. This campus is not conservative anymore. This campus isn't just like, you can do whatever you want and nobody's going to even worry. But Jesus adds value. So, Father, this evening we've come together as your church. And it's quite chilly. It's cold, we know. But we want to thank you for your invitation to bring life to us. I want to thank you for every person that's standing here. Some have come to visit. Some are here, Lord, for the first time. Some of you have been here many times. Lord, I pray that you will shine your spotlight of your love into our hearts. I pray, Father, that you'll draw people unto yourself right now. I pray, Father, that you'll show us your unconditional love. A love that breaks every barrier. A love, Lord, that just goes beyond what people will ever do. Because you said, Lord, your love, Lord, nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing, Lord, nothing. Father, I pray for every man and every woman here. 
that tonight will be a burning bush experience. Not just another church service. Because of your invitation. Because of your life. So I'm going to ask you while every eye is closed in this place. If you are here tonight and you're, you know that Jesus is not number one in your life. He's maybe number three or four, maybe number seven. And you've been looking for the opinion of people, just like Peter. You've been really looking for an identity and a purpose and a calling over your life. And tonight you want to make Jesus number one. You want to say, Lord, I realize that while you are faithful and true, you cannot lie. You love unconditionally. But tonight I'm coming to deny myself. Tonight I want to start to follow you. If that's you tonight, I want you to raise your hand very high where you are standing. Because you need to do serious business with God. And just say to him, Lord, I want to do it right. I want to say yes. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. Some more hands going up. Just say to Jesus, Jesus, that's, that's you. I want to follow you. I don't want to play games anymore. I don't want to just do little bits. I want to give you all. Because he gave everything publicly for you. Once you've raised your hand, you can lower it again. Lots of hands going up. And I want to, I'm going to ask something very strong, but it's going to be quite tough. Because Jesus said you must deny yourself. So tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity to deny the opinion of people around you by worrying about what they think. But I want to tell you, they can't save you and I can't save you. But tonight maybe you must take the first step to say no to what people think and say yes to what Jesus thinks. You need to put your life in His hands. And he's going to begin to use you. Ordinary spoon, ordinary fork, ordinary thing. But he makes it extraordinary because he adds value. So if you raise your hand, if you're shy, bring somebody next to you with you. But I want you to step out from where you are and come and join me right in front here. Because I'm going to pray with you. We're going to pray a prayer of commitment to Jesus to make him number one. Come on, if you raise your hand, I want you to be serious about making him Lord of your life. Just say to people next to you, excuse me, excuse me. I'm saying yes. Come and line up right here in front of me. I know you can face me. You don't, you don't need to face people. Because <laughs> tonight is the first step of saying yes to him. And he forgives. He makes all things new. He just gives us life in abundance. I want some facilitators to come and stand, especially behind these people and just maybe... Keep them warm because some of them are cold, okay? But if you have made a commitment tonight, you've raised your hand. I want you to step out from where you are. While the rest of us are praying because this is very important moments. These are our moments, life-changing moments. And you just say like, yo, but, but, but you don't know where I've come from, Sias. You don't know what's happened in my life. I want to tell you, Jesus takes a little fork like this tonight. And he puts it. He says, I'm going to add value to it. People walk all over the world. That little fork in that little museum that Sir Winston Churchill ate with a couple of years ago, 60 years ago, is worth $100,000, say. But Jesus said he bought you with a precious, precious, precious price. You can't value it in earthly terms. 